I have a question about the consultative map yeah. that you showed. So is that a tool that you use? Yeah, I could, um, if you give me a business card afterwards, I can, uh, I can send you a link to a site that, that has it there. Fantastic. So you can see yeah. it. It's very so, powerful. Yeah. So um, I'm curious to know how, in your consulting work, um, how consultation is processed. You mean in that, using that tool? Yeah. Well, you don't, you, do, you don't just use that tool. You don't right. keep the public at arm's length and try never to talk to them. Um, but, uh, I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the examples I'm aware of, which is what that um, particular slide illustrated was uh, the development of a, a parking strategy for a local government area which included a, a shopping area. So there was a lot of overflow parking into residential streets, etc. And so, you know, there was, the intention was to develop a parking management strategy um, and uh, there was um, an opportunity provided to residents in the community to initially uh, provide an indication of where they felt there were problems with on-street parking. And then in a second round of uh, communication, um, a, a draft parking strategy was, was put up onto the, the site and people were given the opportunity to comment on it. Um, in parallel with that, there, there were some focus group type meetings in local community centres, but um, you know, again, well, one of the things that's happened uh, is that to do the costs of doing comprehensive public consultation uh, have have you know grown significantly. So um, there's there's quite an impetus to find a way to engage with uh, a, a, you know, a statistically significant proportion of the community um, in, a, in a very efficient manner. And then having identified that there are particular problems in particular areas, then have meetings in those areas rather than trying to decide where to hold meetings and hoping you'll flush out the problems. But I mean, you can do it with, you know, you could do it with a road scheme, you could do it with a where to locate um, public trans tra transport stops along a, along a bus route or a light rail route, you know. Yeah. It, oh. If I could answer um, two, if I could just ask two follow-up questions to that. Um, I mean, consultation certainly is a kind of messy thing and it's contentious, you know, in our, in our city, you know, where, was this community properly consulted and, and so on. And so I'm curious to know, you know, with the rise um, of, this, of this online, you know, as you start more efficient, Process less less expensive process. In your four years of experience, do you find it's it's um, as successful as an old-fashioned consulting? Um, does it create um, more successful projects and, and so on? You know, I think I, look. I think that's a that's a good question. Um, I don't think the one. I don't think the collaborative map is a substitute for face to face, but it is a way of. Uh, fine-tuning where the faces you maybe should be talking to mm -hmm. are located. Um, and you'd be surprised, I mean, there isn't a limit on how much people can write in those virtual yellow stickies, so you do get quite a few uh, diatribes, fairly heated comments in some instances, so, yeah, look, Look, I, I, I hear the point you're making, but I think on balance I, I'm sort of keen on this, on this next approach. And the other thing is that, you know, maybe the younger members of the population, you know, sitting there with their iPad in the cafe, are more kind of, or iPhone, are more likely to engage with this process than, you know, turning up to some scout hall to, uh, for tea and biscuits.
Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, experience. It, it, um, it sort of hit home with me. I'm an engineer. I've been uh, an engineer for quite some time. And, and you mentioned um, we have something in common. You mentioned that you had built or caused to be built some things that weren't very good. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and at some point, um, we both learned that we needed to do things differently. Mm -hmm. What was what was your moment of uh, deciding to take on the the role of Sisyphus? <laughs> oh, how many bottles of red wine have we got? I I um look, I think that. You know, what I was reflecting upon were um, um, outcomes to do with, uh, you know, they were, they were organisational outcomes rather than physical outcomes. You know, they were to do with how, I, you know, how I felt an office should function or... or, or the firm in Australia should function or parts of the global firm should function. I had pretty clear ideas, which I think you have to do, um, but you have to be prepared to listen to other people as well. And um, sometimes when you believe you're, not, you're Joan of Arc and you've got to get a job done, you're not as good at listening as you probably should be. That's when you need to have, uh, you know, trusted friends, of one or two, who, who, who know they can tell you, David, you're way out of line, you know. You need to, you need to sit back and rethink this. And, and I guess there was a time when someone was actually saying that to me and I wasn't listening, I chose not to listen or it didn't suit me to listen. I mean, you know, you, you get into these cathartic moments when you think back about things that happened. Um, so, I don't know that you know enough about these things as they're happening. My hope is that by talking to people about my own experiences, they might realize that yesterday or last week they might have got a bit out of line and they can think about how they could rectify that situation before it gets too too bad and they've they've hurt somebody yeah what what i was getting at is um for a, a few decades we were all building sprawl ah yep and there are still people doing that it, and um, so, so what the the insight I'm looking for from your from your uh, viewpoint is is at, at how do we help people to recognize and have that chagrin moment and and decide you know to do things sustainably or to do them better. Okay. Well, I suppose that's one of the. Um, objectives that I hoped we would achieve in, in, uh, in putting in place a, a, a policy and strategy around sustainability at Arup because we, we actually say in the policy that um, we won't, we, we, we kept it a little bit loose deliberately but in essence we gave people the right, our staff the right to say we're not going to do this job because we consider it to be unsustainable. And that, you know, that could mean we're not going to work for a developer who wants to do a subdivision 20 kilometres from the nearest railway station. Um, but then you get, you know, you, <laughs> you might have seen, you probably didn't, but you might have seen on that, on that little chart of, of um, dilemmas, there was, a, there was a quote, you know, sustainable project or sustainable for Arab? A sustainable project or a sustainable Arab? So, you know, what do you do when you're the group leader of, of 120 people 
and your options are to take the job with um, uh, Saudi Aramco to deliver a project in Saudi, which you know will keep 120 people and more busy for two years, or say no, which means you know you'll have to make 70% of those people redundant. Now that's the kind of decision that I think throws into sharp focus what business enterprise sustainability is all about. And I, I'm actually running a forum uh, in two weeks' time at the National Engineering Convention of Engineers Australia in Melbourne, where we're going to explore that very topic. And I, you know, I mean, to me, sustainability is so much more than, uh, you know, is is this a six-star, green-star building? It goes to the very heart of those kinds of decisions. And I mean, I, I was, I suppose, fortunate to work in a firm which did give its staff that freedom. So, you know, people would regularly say, I'm not going to work on this project, and I've got a problem with it. But we, I don't believe we, and there might have been a couple of projects where in the end, you know, the project didn't happen because sufficient people said, we're not going to work on it. But not enough, <laughs> but not enough. Because at the end of the day, there's always somebody who's more concerned maybe rightly so, about uh, maintaining employment for a group of people. And then you get the, which is the oh so cute um, professional service response, well, someone's going to do it, so it might as well be Arab. You probably heard that one. Good question. Good night, um, Hector. Is, um, you mentioned that um, after the senior Abra house, uh, Arab redefined the relationship between the architect and the engineer. Uh, I would like to know your take into your role of not just uh, helping shaping cities, but also shaping identities. No, it's not just uh, the Sydney Opera house is um, it comes to my mind, the um, Oresund bridge uh, between Sydney and Denmark, Denmark that really just is a um, place that they take you to show you when you're around because they feel yeah. they have acknowledged the place of them as yeah. they belong to them. No? Yeah, well, I think you, you know, when you work for, I think Oriston is a great example. When you work for a, a, a firm that gets the opportunity to deliver a pro I, I would be so brave as to say that when Arab was first commissioned to deliver Oriston, they had no idea how economically and regionally significant that project was. You know, it was, it was a great bridge and tunnel. And, and, and um, uh, but, 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 you know, then they became aware that actually what they were, what they were being given the opportunity to deliver was something that totally changed the way two countries coexisted. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's great. But that doesn't come along all that often. And, you, do, you know, you can't, you can't sort of aim to have the luxury of only doing those kind of jobs. But, but I mean, I think... I mean, right now, Arab is just about finishing a bridge and viaduct and tunnel linking Hong Kong and Macau. What's the purpose of that? But anyway, it's being done. It's an engineering marvel. So people can fly into Hong Kong and drive to Macau to gamble. Some things don't make sense. Hi. Uh, one of your slides showed uh, an acronym, I think, SPEAR, uh, from around 1991. And it looked like it was talking about uh, metrics involved in urban sustainability. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, a subject I've taken on as a PhD. I was wondering if you hmm. had moved that uh, yes. forward at all? Yes. Um, yes, okay, so that's sustainable project evaluation and assessment regime or something like that, uh, SPEAR. And uh, that tool has been progressively updated over time. 
It even withstood the, um, the ravages of the North American approach, which removed one of the four quadrants and turned it into three segments. Um, so if you, if you Google Spear at Arup, you'll find it. We also developed a, another tool with similar construct called, given the acronym, Aspire, which, which deals with um, sort of social and economic development projects, so very much in the third world. So they're, yeah, they're, they're still around. Uh, and I suppose one of the values, one of the benefits that comes from being uh, uh, trust owned is that Arab still manages to put a certain amount of money every year into R&D that will continue to find the funds to update those sorts of tools. But there's a lot else that's been written in that space, so I'm sure when you really start your literature review, you're going to throw up a lot. Too much. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, I wonder if uh, Mr. Richard Wozni had a, a sort of uh, hard uh, infrastructural issues, you know, uh, water and, and, and sewer systems and so on, and the cell phone was for health, education, and I think uh, legal legal aspect, and uh, and that that'll help me frame the, the question I was trying to ask last night from uh, Doug Saunders when he was uh, after his talk, uh, which is to say in in, in uh, how many of your projects or where have you noticed a good uh, sort of uh, allocation of tariffs uh, that are directed appropriately from a certain population in a planned project or in a neighborhood or whatever have you um, that were allocated properly so that for those soft targets of health education and legal thing, again, things that you can imagine that were allocated properly uh, to fund it or, or something like that. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I think I... I think I understand the question you're asking. Um, I think you tend to see those things more, those concerns more in the projects in the developing world because the international lending agencies tend to require that those um, broader set of criteria be met. And we've, I mean, we aren't as, I wonder how many years it's gonna take me to stop saying we. We aren't as, um, as involved in, in developing world projects as some, uh, some firms are, but certainly we've done quite a few. And I mean, that Aspire tool that I just meant to, mentioned address, addresses all that broader gamut of uh, criteria, as does the Infrastructure Sustainability Council rating tool ISCA's rating tool that I mentioned in my presentation. It, it, it addresses uh, not, not completely yet, but we're adding capability to the metrics. So those things are being increasingly addressed. Um, so, I mean, sometimes decision makers don't want, <laughs> decision makers don't always want all the possible metrics to be reported. You may be aware of that.